Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audio-visual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel. I'm a draftsman and the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I offer you episode 60, and I will have this talk with uh, artist Peter Drake. It's crazy that it's 60 episodes, guys. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also subscribing to my audiovisual channel. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to support, to show your support with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly for, from my website, which is gabriellahandle.com, just one word. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay, buy prints of my drawings, or leaving me a tip. Thank you for your time and attention in watching this episode, and do leave a comment so I know you watched this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Have a great day. Okay, Peter Drake, thank you very much for agreeing to be on my podcast. You are episode 60 of A Conversation About Art. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Uh, I'm a provost at the New York Academy of Art, and I'm a working artist. I'm represented by Craighead Green Gallery in Dallas. Uh, I've got a solo show up there right now until March 25th. And I'm also represented by Linda Warren Projects in Chicago and Michael Healy in Mexico, but that's kind of a, a newer <laughs> relationship, new and very old. He's a collector that I've known for 20 years, and he just opened a gallery in San Miguel. Okay. Well, all that is awesome. I, I do I do remember you having <clears throat> representation with Linda Warren, because uh, I feel like I've heard that one often. Um, so that's really cool, especially about the, the solo show there, but all of that representation. Nice job. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny, over the course of my life, I've curated shows, I've written a bit for, you know, artist catalogs and for Flash Art Magazine. Um, I was an artist curator at the Drawing Center. Uh, I taught at Parsons for 20 years. I taught a little bit at MICA and SVA um, and, uh, you know, just uh, been around. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um you recently became a provost, and I don't strictly want to get that much into into this this part of your career, but I, I, I personally don't understand what is a provost. What does that mean? Um, it really was a, just a change in title. My responsibilities are more or less the same. In many schools, a provost has more of a financial uh, responsibility for the school, but generally speaking, they oversee all of the deans in you know a, a larger university setting, but because we only have one provost and, or, or a dean. Mm -hmm. I'm overseeing myself. <laughs> All right, so you better behave. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you something else. Ah, what, what do you mean by working artist? Um, you know, a, a lot of the times when you have an administrative job in the arts or, uh, or if you're teaching full time, you just don't have the time in the studio that you'd like but I really try to make an effort to get to the studio as much as possible. Um, I try to design my life at the academy so that, um, you know, I can have weekends free as much as I can. And, you know, like last night, I took a subway from the school to my studio in Dumbo, which is really only a 15 minute ride and, you know, put in two or three hours at night. Okay, so then working artist, um, in your in your case, at least, means to put some degree of to invest some degree of some amount of time in the studio. Da does that mean daily or? Uh, it changes. You know, it depends on your the responsibilities at school. There there are many times at the academy where there are evening events or the you know I feel a a genuine obligation to support all the alumni. So I try to go to as many alumni openings as I can. Mm -hmm. um, so that obviously inhibits things to a certain degree, but I, I guess when I when I say working artist, I I mean that I'm still in the studio. I consider that to be my first priority, um, even though it's not to, doesn't ha I don't give it as much time as I do to the academy. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yes. Thank you for elaborating on that. Um, 
because uh, I guess it's really, it's something that is probably in every artist's mind, you know, like the amount of time that you invest in your studio. And I've been thinking about not just the the stuff that I invest time thinking about, but doing also, because it's, it's, they're similar in a way, you know, thinking and doing, and it's like, um, you know, the, the amount of time that you invest doing something, it's like, you know, I want to become really good at drawing, so then I must invest the time in drawing, so practicing drawing. So then, like, if I were to use that time, like, as a cashier in a restaurant, for example, which is what I used to do uh, back home uh, in Panama, um, it's like, all right, so then I'm going to be a really good cashier. <laughs> Can you, you see what I'm saying? And yeah. uh, similarly to the types of stuff that one inve that I invest time thinking about, like I've been trying to sort of clean out in my thoughts the things that I choose to think about in order to kind of think about more edifying things and more positive things and like a working the brain muscle and, you know, trying to develop ideas and this type of stuff. Uh, so it's really great to hear you to hear you elaborate on that. Well, it's funny, uh, yeah. you know, if I could expand on that a little yeah, bit, do, please. you know, most artists can't afford to just be in the studio all the time. You're either going to be taking on some other gig or you're going to be, you know, you have to be writing grants or you're going to residencies or you're applying for public art projects or maybe you're working on a print series, you know, they're I, I refer to this as having a table with 12 legs. You know, mm -hmm. if you're in your life, if one of those legs gets pulled out, the table still stands, but you want to have as many legs as possible. So, you know, teaching is certainly one of those things. I know people that survive almost exclusively on doing workshops and things like that. So, you know, it's just, a, it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't um, also lead to your creative life in many times through teaching, you get inspired to do something that, you know, was unexpected. Mm -hmm. And so they all sort of feed each other in different ways. But I know, you know, there've been times in my life where I was spending almost all of my creative time working on animations. You know, there've been other times in my life where, you know, the only things that sold were prints that I had done over the course of uh, several years, you know? So um, it's just, that's sort of the nature of a life in the arts for most people. Okay. Um, okay, so I would I would like to know a bit about your relationship with art. In uh, when did it start, and you know how how would how how did it develop, and why do you still do it? Um, you know, I was actually very lucky. I had a sister. Um, she was fourteen years older than me, and she was studying art herself. And so she started teaching me how to paint when I was seven years old. And I remember copying my first Picasso when I was nine. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what I was actually painting. And it wasn't until I was finished with it that I realized it was a still life. <laughs> but <laughs> that was the nature of uh, a nine-year-old looking at Picasso. So, um, you know, she started me off with watercolors and then we moved to oils pretty quickly. And, you know, I basically taught myself how to paint alongside of her. You know, she'd be copying something and I would copy something at the same time. And so I consider myself very lucky in that respect. Plus, my father was a writer director for uh, NBC Radio in the news division, but he started out his creative life writing radio drama for probably mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and he, so he's a very creative man and, you know, wrote a lot of really interesting, but kind of corny. Um, mystery series like uh, Mike Steele Adventurer was one uh -huh. of the shows that he wrote for many years and but he was both my parents were extremely supportive of my creative interests and you know I can remember as a kid I would before saying goodnight to my father I would show him the caricatures that I had drawn in you know while watching tv or whatever mm -hmm. um and so you know that was just the nature of my life and you know, when we would go on family trips, he would, he was the type of person who, you know, he took us all to Italy. And uh, I remember the day before seeing uh, Michelangelo's David, he took my brother and myself on a long walk and said, you're going to see one of the most magnificent things that 
uh, exists in the world tomorrow and I want to prepare you for this. And he just went on a long description about Michelangelo and the David and how to look at it. And, it, you know, that was the kind of environment that I was raised in. And, you know, he would come home from work at night and he would have, you know, interviewed uh, John Glenn or, or a famous politician or, you know, a famous actor. And, you know, it became a kind of guessing game, you know, and, you know animal mineral or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I was raised in a, I think, a very fortunate environment for a creative person. Yes. Okay. And then... Uh, what is what is the medium that you use currently, like for this this uh, the, the sandpaper stuff that you do? Is it that's is that acrylic? Uh, yeah, it's acrylic. Although I've done it with oil too. Um, it's subtractive, and it's kind of a funny story behind that because um, I was working in a very I was living in a studio apartment on Delancey Street back in the early '80s, and uh, I was working primarily doing black and white ink drawings. So I had you know, white ink and black ink, and I would just sort of correct my uh, pieces, largely using white ink. And at a certain point, I ran out of it. And I remember just feeling like frustrated that I couldn't make the adjustments that I wanted to. And I just started sanding into mm. the paper. And a couple of things happened that were was interesting for me. For one thing, it just looked unfamiliar. So there was something about it that was exciting because I didn't feel like I had seen it before. But then another aspect of it was that it looked degraded. And I had been looking at a lot of, you know, like Giotto and Masaccio and, um, and Piero and, and looking at, at frescoes that had decayed in effect. And I liked that idea that you could have some aspect of your work feel like it was degraded or um, decaying in, in a way. It gave it a partly just a sense of age, but also I think a, a little bit of a sense of destruction that I was mm -hmm. looking for. So it was just kind of a funny coincidence. And that's it's not that I work entirely subtractively. In fact, now I work probably 80%, maybe 90% of the time uh, positively, additively. Mm -hmm. But um, I still, in my drawing practice, tend to work almost exclusively subtractively. Okay. Um, okay. But, but um, the drawing practice that you're talking about, I mean, is, is that, is, is that how you, I mean, I don't know how to ask the question. Is, I mean, is that, like, uh, do you remember when we did this thing with their magazine at the Academy and we were working in the same studio and like you had like the, the pieces of paper with the layers of the acrylic paint and then you started doing the thing with this, the subtractive thing with the sandpaper. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it something like that? I mean, it's it's something like that on the paper that the, on your drawing practice that you're talking about, or are, yeah. are those just drawings to you? Well, those are primarily for my drawings, but there were periods in my life when I would start every painting on an iron oxide red ground that I would sand through. You know, I prepared the surface with modeling paste and gesso, and you know, I'd sand through the gesso and it would create a kind of pixelated surface. Actually, if you can see that horse that's behind me, the black yeah. and white one, mm -hmm. that's a subtractive piece. Uh, these two nudists here are also largely subtractive. Um, and even this baseball player um, is uh, sub largely subtractive. It's a subtractive drawing that I then glazed over with uh, thin veils of mostly transparent chromatics. Okay. Okay, but then uh, all of them have this method of with the sandpaper, is that right? In this particular case, everything but the Vermeer. The Vermeer copy is uh, just oil painting on paper, on prepared paper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Um, why would you mind going more into why you like this method with the sandpaper? And and also, do you after you use the sandpaper? Uh, do you then just go? You start. You paint more. It depends. You know, sometimes I've. I try to keep it as pure as possible and it's just purely subtractive, but there are times when I just need to go back into it and will you know, paint back into it with either black paint in the case of the horse, or as I said, transparent chromatics in the case of the baseball player. But um, I don't always do that. And I, I think the reason I was drawn to it at first, you know, like I said, that element of destruction was something that I was looking for because I wanted to have the sense that the pieces had 
you know, that there was the passage of time somehow implied in the work. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, um, and this was very important to me at the very beginning of my career, I just felt like I wanted to do something. I wanted to defamiliarize the process of painting for myself because I felt like I was talented enough that, you know, I could more or less make the kinds of paintings that I wanted to, but they didn't look to me different. Like there was no justification for them because they didn't have a feeling that in my mind was unique. I wanted to find mm -hmm. some language in painting. And it wasn't just about a signature style or anything like that. It was more the frustration of being a young artist and feeling like you're just repeating history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that seems really quite interesting. Um, so, so, so then, Okay. You want me to talk about how I got involved in the art world? Um, well, I mean, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's just that I'm, I'm just curious about the thought. I, I just, I think, I find the thoughts about this, the, the the relationship that we have as artists with art history, and you know, you were talking about it just now. Um, because and and like I guess with you, what you were talking about just now, especially because you wanted to find something, just something different, anything different, basically. Mm -hmm. um or anything that felt different any something that felt unfamiliar um but at the same time you want it to you want you want it or want to i suppose you still want your work to have that element of aging like as it is as it if it as if it is part of you know history. that already and, and and it feels like a contrasty kind of thing in a way um I just think yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I understand what yeah. you're saying. It, it feels like a contradiction because, and it, and it was, you know, if I'm looking at the Stations of the Cross by um, Piero, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by that, but I don't want to repeat it absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would take, for instance, um, sections of the Stations of the Cross, but I would set it in a suburban pool environment. Mm -hmm. And then I would, as I said, sort of use my technique or a technique that I was evolving at that time to suggest the passage of time or the sense of something decaying. And so there, in many ways, is an embrace of art history and at the same time, a need to not repeat it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So... I would like it if you went a little bit more into the destruction part that you were talking about also. Mm -hmm. um, what, because I mean, a, I mean, part of it is having, having the artwork look like more time has passed than it actually has passed, like physically. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, is there something else in there? Is, I mean, I guess I'm curious because you use the term destruction specifically, you know? Yeah, I think metaphorically, what I was looking for, I, you know, most of my work uh, over the course of the past 40 years has been about a kind of, a, you know, a suburban malaise, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. you know, the, the sense that you're, I'm looking at my life, I'm looking at the life that I was surrounded by and recognizing that, you know, even though it was posited as, you know, a kind of I post-war ideal world to live in, in many ways, it was a, you know, a corrosive environment. There was a lot of, you know, addiction issues. There was, you know, s violence that was frequently, you know, um, hidden. And so for me, that destruction of the paper, that destruction of the medium, I wanted it to echo in some ways what I saw as the corrosive aspect of a sub suburban um, upbringing. And as, like I said, I'm, I'm not saying necessarily that this was true for my family. It's just that I know it was true for many families around me. And it certainly is true for certain members of my family too. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to find a way to use the language that I was developing metaphorically to talk about what I saw as the destructive nature of this lifestyle that I was immersed in. Mm -hmm. um, this whole suburban thing, I feel like, it's it's a subject that comes up a lot, not just in art, um, but you know it's in movies also, for example, because they they have like um, 
uh these all of these very pretty houses like mold lawns and like the houses are very similar cool the socks i don't know how you pronounce that um but and it seems you know it, it reminds me a little bit of the catholic church because it like like i i understand wanting the appearance of placidity and calmness and harmony and because i think that's like the purpose or the desire be behind wanting to look that way at least outwardly but then it's like it doesn't take into consideration all of the ups and downs and just like the um, intricacies and complexities that is within every single individual that is within those houses and so like that makes it 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 really makes makes the the curiosities of each of each person it makes them seem like just abnormal freak people you know even though yeah. it's it's it but but only in contrast with that seemingly with that like perfect setting mm -hmm. not that those things are wrong obviously that's normal but if you if you if you if you put it together with that setting then it looks really out of place you know well and i i think there was you know this the sense at least in post world war ii america that you know the, America was emerging, uh, you know, on the international stage as this sort of perfect democracy, right? And that, you know, the in in many ways the the victors of World War II. Um, so there's that sense, at least in my mind, as these men and women came back from this experience, that they had earned the right to a kind of ideal world, mm -hmm. and that just doesn't exist. So that's part of what I find fascinating about that world is that there's this very human need for perfection that can never be achieved. And frequently when it is attempted, um, it results in, you know, destruction. It, it results in a corrosive environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, Provost Drake, what is art in your opinion? <laughs> well, I gather you were going to be asking these questions. Yeah. Um, you know, ever since Duchamp basically took a urinal from one place and put it in another, he opened up a Pandora, Pandora's box that basically said art can be anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is still true. And I think in many ways, that's why we're in a kind of critical cr uh, crisis at the moment because there's no sense of you know of any kind of critical hegemony in the way that there there used to be um but so i think for me the question is less what is art because i genuinely believe absolutely anything can be art if you can tape a banana to a wall and sell it you know somebody's made art but whether or not it's good art whether or not it's challenging art whether or not it's art that's actually expanding upon what art can be. Um, that's a different question. And I think what happens for me anyways in the art world is I, I'm less interested in saying what's the best art so much as inside of a certain idiom, no matter what it is, um, what is the best work that's being made inside of that idiom? Because frequently, if you try to compare somebody who's doing performance work to somebody who's doing a sound art to somebody who's making paintings or sculptures, you're comparing apples to kumquats. There's absolutely no way that you can establish a critical criteria that is inclusive. But I think what you can do is establish cr critical criteria for each idiom. And I think that that's actually maybe uh, a more interesting place to be as a creative person inside of the idiom of, you know, progressive figuration. Who are the people that are doing interesting work right now? You know, who are the what are the what aspects of your own studio practice do you feel is engaged with the ideas that are currently involved with progressive figuration? You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Mm -hmm. So you do, so in your opinion, there are no problems with saying that anything can be art. It's I. <laughs> I, like I said, it doesn't always result in great art. It just, but I don't think that I would ever rule anything out from being art. Like mm -hmm. I said, it just may not be good art, may not be interesting art. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, I think two episodes ago, I had an artist named Devin Cecil uh, as a guest, and when we got to this question, he mused about a comparison with food, and um, I didn't think about this in the episode because I would have liked to 
further go into that, but I thought about it afterwards and I'll tell you now and you can tell me what you think. Um, so he was talking about indeed how there is good, good food and bad food because you have, of course, McDonald's, for example, and you have then the food that is uh, lovingly made by a family member for Thanksgiving, for example, you know, like one is terrible, the McDonald's and the good one. And, you know, the one that has more intention and more thought into uh, put into it is the Thanksgiving one made by whomever in your family, you know? Um, <clears throat> so those are both food and some is good and some is bad, but there is still a lot of stuff that is not food. Um, so Um, I just, anyway, tell, tell me what you think about that so far. Um, it's, it's a curious comparison. You know, I, I think you could expand on it certainly by saying it's interesting how often <clears throat> people are drawn to bad food. You know, you just, uh, Americans have an addiction to salt and sugar and fat. So if you eat, eat, you know, McDonald's French fries, you're getting a lot of salt, sugar, and fat. And there's a, a, sort of perfectly human reason for wanting to have you know fast food once in a while in your life you wouldn't want to do it too often because it would kill you but um there's still that need for you know whatever it is the the kind of cheap experience um but then on the high end of the food world if you're talking about you know the best chefs in the world and the kind of you know amazing taste sensations that they can create you know, that's another world that's like so elite and so extreme at times that it's both beautiful in the way that any uh, extraordinarily creative thing is, but it's also exclusive and many people will never experience that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, it's not entirely unlike the art world in that respect. Um, you know, I think the, the lovingly made Thanksgiving dinner that you're talking about um, its intention and its love and its its care for um, your family is certainly an, an important part of it, but it's also pretty salty, <laughs> pretty fatty, um, mm -hmm. and probably not something you'd want to have every day of the week, you know? Mm -hmm. So there are, I think, pros and cons to, to all of those experiences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess I also feel like saying that anything can be art um has the problem of it's still not defining what is art um and and uh not not that you're doing this but it kind of feels not that you're specific like i, I don't want to like uh be like you're whatever uh doing something it's just that it kind of feels almost like a a cop out to thinking about trying to define what it is because because like it might not strictly be like oh a painting on canvas it might not strictly be uh, a sculpture but i guess uh what i wonder is just you know what might the definition of it be you know yeah well again to for me the the more important question is what's good art what's great art you know mm -hmm. um for me when i'm around great art <clears throat> there's something ineffable in it. There's something that's absolutely inexplicable about it. In other words, you don't really, you can't put it into words because there's this magic element to it that just cannot be explained. Um, and I'm, I'm always fascinated by that. I'm fascinated when, you know, I look at a Vermeer, for instance, and I have this sort of extraordinary experience of, first of all, being around an artist who I still think is uh, undervalued and under and misunderstood as an artist. Um, but I, there's so much about the work that for me remains um, magically elusive. And I like that. Um, but I also am drawn to art that is both beautiful and challenging. You know, I think one of the other questions you talk about frequently in your podcast is beauty. But simple beauty for me isn't that interesting you know, but beauty that has some kind of undercurrent or uh, a, a sense of, of challenge, you know, challenging you to understand why its beauty is there and how it's different from simple beauty. I think that's uh, an interesting thing to, to focus on. And 
for me, the art that moves me, the art that I continue to be engaged with has all of those elements of the ineffable, um, the challenging beauty. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, you know, some unfamiliar, some defamiliarizing aspect, you know, where suddenly you're looking at things that you thought you understood or that you've been trained to understand. And somebody's added something to the equation that um, forces you to think more deeply. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but then why is the, uh, how, how is, um, what is the, not strictly value, I guess, or, or maybe purpose, I guess, of the question of what is good art or bad art if the term art has no discernment? Can you clarify that? Yeah, because it's like, It's, you know, all right, give me a second. Um, all objects don't have the same value to us. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like a hierarchy of values. Uh, and it's not on purpose. We just are kind of draw, uh, just develop a preference for something or, or other for whatever reason. And it's kind of impossible for all of them to have the exact same value. It's like you're an individual will have a preference for this object or that that object, uh, sentimental value, sentimental value, monetary value, whatever it is. Um, so then I guess it's something similar to uh, something of the sort to art. It's like everything cannot be art because then the term art I feel like becomes pointless because it doesn't separate anything from anything else. So I guess that's like the similarity with the with the muse about food, because it's like there are things that are indeed not food. It's like you, I cannot eat this tin and I can't eat this putty that I'm playing with, you know. So there there are things that are not food, even if within the category of food, there are things that are good food and bad food, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you what do you think about that? Um, <clears throat> I just I disagree with it in principle, just because I prefer a world where anything can be art. I, you know, it, like I said, it may not be great art. It may not be art that will last for very long. But uh, when I was in school, there was a very sort of strict hegemony about what was serious art. And it was all about reductive abstraction. Now, you know, it got to the point where it was almost comical. Uh, I remember reading an article in uh, Art Forum by Marsha Hafif, and she had basically constructed it or curated a show of reductive abstraction where all the artists had to work with the same for format. I think it was like three by three feet or something like that. And then oddly enough, in art form, they published the article in black and white. So you literally couldn't tell one artist from the next. Mm. But if you were going to be taken seriously as an artist at that time, that was the kind of work that you had to be doing. And I remember trying to you know, work figuratively, this is the mid to late 70s, and, you know, basically being um, either marginalized or seen as derivative or whatever else, uh, other criticism, you know, adhered. And it was, that's, that's not an environment that I want to be in, you know, where mm -hmm. somebody is, is basically saying, here are the parameters for what you can do, and you have to operate inside of those parameters, or you won't be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like a world that has, you know, uh, you know, anything from, <laughs> even if it's as stupid as is a banana taped to a wall to, you know, an extraordinary Eric Fischel painting or, you know, Jenny Savile painting, you know, that's, I'd rather be in that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, um, I definitely agree with, or, or at least I can like give the devil his due, I guess, because that um, chaos in a way is what allows both, you know, you and me now uh, in the present to draw and paint whatever we want. And it's possible for that work to sell, for that work to show, you know, like I'm aware, I'm aware that the, that uh, that is exactly what permits this to, that 
you know, need to be able to sometimes draw a bee and sometimes draw a girl. And then, you know, somebody's going to buy that and somebody's going to like it or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, that uh, strictness of that era, because I remember uh, at the Academy also, they talked about how Eric Fischel was just like, just insinuating the figure and everybody was like, what the shit are you doing? It's like, that's old, you know, and it's not that dissimilar from uh, the salons in France that they were like very strict. So it's like, um, you know, in one of them, there's too much order, too much strictness. And then in the other one, there is perhaps, and I guess that's what I'm using about now, there's perhaps way too much chaos. And so like, I guess I feel like there should, there, it's okay if there's some, a little, some kind of midpoint in there that kind of like somehow balances more, you know, yeah. what, what do you think about I mean, that? Well, it's funny, you know, it feels like every year at the Academy, there's somebody who does something that feels radical inside of the Academy's, you know, boundaries, but in the larger art world is a perfectly acceptable thing to do, right? Sure. You know, if somebody were to like make gestural abstraction, it would feel more progressive in the Academy than it would necessarily in the larger art world. And that's always funny because the context, the context changes the, the meaning of the work. Um, I'm not sure if I'm actually addressing the, the issue that you're raising, but you know, that word academic is one of the words that I find kind of fascinating because almost anything can become academic. So when people refer to the kind of work that we do at the New York Academy of Art, as academic, in my mind, it's it's completely uh, problematic because it's the least academic in many ways. Because for something to become academic, <clears throat> it has to become so familiar. You're so familiar with all of its uh, its merits, its strengths, its 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 weaknesses that it no longer has the ability to startle you. It no longer has the ability to wake you up out of you know whatever kind of uh, you know, creative slumber you're experiencing. So anything can become academic. Um, and I, for me, the least academic things are the things that are um, still being challenged by, by society. Mm -hmm. It was one of the one interesting things about starting to work figuratively in, let's say, the early 80s. You know, there was a fair amount of, you know, neo-expressionist work, but it was not like highly realized. It was not um, highly articulated art. It was just, you know, very sort of experiential art. And if you were interested in highly articulated painting, um, you just weren't taken seriously. And it just, it took a long time for people to be interested in the kind of work that we're doing. And this right now is probably one of the best times to be a, a, an informed, articulate, figurative artist that I can remember in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So why don't you um, now, um, Provost Drake, why don't you tell me what is beauty in your opinion? Um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> this is probably going to sound like a cop out too, but um, you can argue that all beauty is some form of social construct, right? That if you look at what is considered beautiful in Northern Europea, Northern Europe, it's very different from what is considered beautiful in Southern Europe. If you look at what was be considered beautiful in the 19th century, it's not necessarily what's considered beautiful now. So it's constantly shifting. And that's part of what's interesting about trying to think about beauty um, because and Sister Wendy sort of put this in an interesting way. Um, Your she sister? said that what? Sister, sister Wendy, Wendy? No, Sister Wendy, the uh, the art critic and historian. She's on public uh, television, or okay. she used to be, anyways. But in any event, um, she would go around the world, sort of talking about masterpieces and why they were considered masterpieces. But she's always kind of had a funny take on it. And one of the things that she said is that most art um, is like. Uh, sucking on a candy that you had the culture has to suck it and see for a certain length of time before it will ever really come to a conclusion about the, whether or not this art is going to last so knowing what you consider to be beautiful in your own era doesn't necessarily mean that it will have that kind of lastingness that you hope for in some kind of um you know 
maybe more permanent sense of beauty. Um, but the things that I find beautiful for me personally are when there's some sense of the sublime in them, you know, when there's some sense of terror or fear mixed in with beauty. Um, and again, that sense of, of the unfamiliar, you know, there are lots of things that are considered beautiful that are in my mind, very mundane, but a beauty that's challenging, you know, a, a beauty that uh, has risk built into it and fear built into it is much more interesting to me. And that's the kind of beauty that I try to seek out in my own work um, and in the work of my colleagues. Um, what do you mean with sublime? Uh, the sublime, you know, it's frequently used in des describing um, like uh, romantic landscapes, right? That if you look at a Turner, they, there's beauty there, but there's also this kind of chaos and, you know, a, a sense of being in the middle of a vortex or something like that. So, you know, that kind of beauty where there's a, a sense of maybe even your smallness in the universe, that's mm -hmm. what I'm referring to as the sublime. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, okay, so then that is what that is what you were referring to also when you were talking about the sense of fear and a terror because I mean uh, I, I guess I guess I'm making that relationship because lots of times people get very impressed by seeing like a huge canyon or like by remembering the universe and how tiny the earth is like this is it something like that yeah I mean if you've ever been at the bottom of the Grand Canyon it's so extraordinary because you just feel miniature you feel like mm -hmm. you're just lost in this giant abyss and it's beautiful i mean it's unquestionably beautiful but it's also terrifying it's you know existentially terrifying mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so i get the impression that it's a contrast of or 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 like the simultaneous existence of being really impressed by something and then being reminded that you know maybe you're mortal or yeah something like that, Does that yeah seem right? absolutely yeah yeah that's cool it makes it makes sense that the addition of th those things would kind of cause uh beauty to be felt um and you know actually that that um reminds me of i mean it kind of makes me think of what you were saying earlier how about how um what did you say what did you say uh, that that beauty is like in culture or, or something um a cultural construct yeah control cultural construct <laughs> can't say words okay um and i think i think it's a mixture of both because yeah to some because, or, or at least you know that's kind of like what i'm musing about here um, because to some extent, obviously, you know, everyone is, each individual is an individual of their time, of their place and stuff. So like, it does make sense that they, that the person would develop some of their own proclivities in terms of what they find beautiful. But at the same time, you know, we're, it, every human is a human. Um, and every human is like the same kind of human that has existed since we were homo sapiens sapiens, you know? So like, um, I, I mean, I guess what I'm like insinuating is that there is there is a sense of beauty that is just the same and constant for everyone. Because I don't know if you I don't know if you've read a book a book called uh, The Art Instinct by Dennis Dutton. He starts the book by talking about um, a study that some Russians made, where where they interviewed people from I don't know how many different countries. Um, to like find out what kind of stuff they liked. And then the, these Russian guys went and made the paintings that oh, the people described. Oh, you're talking about Komar and Melamed. Yes. Komar and Melamed are the artists that did that. And they basically, it, it was kind of a, they're, they're funny guys on a, on a certain level because I think they were, they knew that if they asked the general public to fill out a survey of what would make a beautiful painting, that they would come up with something that was absolutely not a beautiful painting. They'd have come up with something that was a cliche. They'd come up with something that's basically, you know, 
art by committee. Um, and it's why so much public art is frequently bad because it's art by committee instead of art by an artist. And so they ended up with paintings. They always had to have an animal in the foreground. There had to be a lot of blue paint in it. There had to be a lake somewhere. There had to be in mountains in the distance. And it, so they, they queried, I mean, I mean, literally thousands of people and came up with a very bad, stupid painting. Mm -hmm. But they, mm -hmm. you know, in many people's minds, it was beautiful but it was beautiful because it was safe and it was a cliche and it was already known, it was familiar, it didn't challenge them in any way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, but then at the same time, it's like the subject matter, it's still, it's like a huge field with animals and a lake. It's not, it's not that dissimilar from looking at a huge expanse of a landscape looking into the horizon. So like I, I um, what I like about that is that they're talking about that universal sense of what, all humans, because again, it's like all humans are, you know, the same physical components, at least, um, find beautiful and what they're drawn to. It's like, I, I, I kind of also feel like they maybe deliberately made shitty paintings based on the descriptions, because it's like, you can paint a shitty landscape, but you can also paint an amazing landscape. And that sure. has that sublime thing in uh, about it, you know? Yeah, and it's one of the things that's curious. If you look at the collection of the Met and you look for you know, Van Roysdale or Koyup or something like that. Yeah, there, there's a cow in the foreground, there's a lake, there are mountains in the background, but they do it in a way that's extraordinary. You know, they do it in a way that um, still has that ineffable quality to it. Yes, yes. But it sounds like you're also trying to see if there's anything that is inherently beauty beautiful that will, you know, never change, that will always be in an essential human experience that it, if, if there's some aspect of beauty that is un, unchanging. Something like that, I guess. And, and also really just like, what is it? <laughs> cause, um, because I've been musing also, cause you know, the, the aspect of nature as the source of beauty or like a big part of beauty at least has definitely come up before. And that also is consonant with what we were uh, talking about just now. Um, but much more than, a visual thing. Um, I kind of have been thinking about beauty, the feeling that it invokes in the viewer or like within the person. I, I kind of feel like it's the same for everyone. It's like, um, recently I was musing about it as, uh, you know, this Bruce Lee saying about, uh, become, be like water. Um, because water takes the shape of the container that it's in. So then like each container is different, like every person is different, but then the water is always water and the water just takes the shape of the container, whatever person that is. So then like, I guess that's kind of what I'm trying to say is that beauty is water and it's like the feeling is always the same, even if the individual is different. So it's like, oh, like that sense of like, you have to stop and kind of try to deal with the sublime that you were talking about just now, for example, of looking at the landscape and being amazed by it, that you have to stop and contemplate not just it, but then remember that you are very small on earth and there's a sky and, you know, like that sense, I feel like it must be very similar for everyone. It probably is, but I know that there are certain landscapes that other people find bleak and, you know, sure. lacking in beauty when, you know, other people, I mean, there's some, some parts of the Southwest that can, you know, you look at the Great Salt Lake and, some people would find that to be not beautiful at all, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I still find even that kind of bleak beauty to be beautiful in a different way. Like, I mean, this is a, a silly kind of a association, but I was talking to Kenneth Greenhead um, at, at the gallery recently about a particular landscape that I had made and it was set in New Hampshire. And one of the things that I was interested in is the fact that on a gray day, you know, a, a kind of weather that most people would find lacking in beauty, this lake that we go to on a regular basis is still very beautiful and has a kind of magical charm to it because it's not typically beautiful. You know, it's got its own kind of bleak beauty that I find interesting. And kind of, you know, actually there's there are lakes in Texas, it turns out, that are very similar in the kind of... Uh, you know, stone outcroppings that are there. And he showed me some photographs that easily could have been 
uh, in New Hampshire. And I find that that kind of landscape to me right now much more challenging and much more interesting. Although it's funny, one of the other things that I was thinking, because I've done a few landscapes this past couple of years, and one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, is there a way to make a sunset painting that isn't a cliche? Is there some way to, and I like sort of approaching problems like that. Like there was one period where I was doing a, a number of paintings that were set in Venice, and it was incredibly difficult to make a painting about a Venetian cityscape because it's been done so often mm -hmm. that it just feels like a cliche. It feels like a joke that you, it's very hard to get away from all of the knowns about it. And that's particularly true of a landscape or, or of a sunset. I mean, they're just so corny, you know, they're just so ridiculous, but uh, challenging yourself to do something like that is actually interesting to me because it really does force you to say, okay, what do I have to get out of this picture in order for it to not be a cliche? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, um, what an interesting problem to try to solve. Cause I, I agree with you that, well, I mean, in the case of sunset paintings, it's, they generally seem to be pretty cheesy or just yeah. like trite, you know, just because it's been done so very much. But then I also, um, you know, like like you probably, which is probably why you're thinking about the problem, there must be a way to make it refreshing, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Can I actually uh, mention one other thing yes. about that? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you do this, but I, whenever I go to like a tourist center, a place where there's like lots of, you know, seasonal activity i always like to seek out the schlock art galleries because frequently artists that paint for tourists are very talented like they've got mm -hmm. lots of skill but they always go wrong somewhere in their painting like there's too many seagulls or there's like too many sailboats or mm -hmm. there's the cheesy sunset or whatever and it's always interesting for me to go to those galleries and try to figure out where they went wrong and if they could have made a good painting or an, in, an interesting painting out of this, if they had just avoided all those cliches, is mm -hmm. there some way to do, you know, a sailboat picture that doesn't feel like the thousands and thousands of cheesy sailboat pictures that you've seen over the course of your life? Um, it's just, it, there's, it's a fascinating thing to do, to go someplace like all over Phoenix, there are like cowboy art galleries. You can't believe how many cowboy art paintings there are and artists there are. And I'm telling you, some of them are really, really talented, but they're cheesy. You know, they don't, they don't look at the world, you know, through an objective or even, you know, an interesting eye. Mm -hmm. They just keep repeating the past. They do, mm -hmm. they're just, they're satisfying an appetite almost the way McDonald's satisfies an appetite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to kind of ask you more stuff about that, but we're at the 51 minute mark here. So it's been almost an hour. Um, yes. All right. Well, I, I guess we should just close it out, start closing it out. But um, because, all right, all right. Oh, okay, real quick. So it's just that there's like two things there because do you think that maybe those people, you know, the people that are like repeating the same thing, do you think that it's like, you know, uh, somebody that maybe just got out of the academy, but then some gallery really liked the work and then now they're kind of like stuck in that subject matter because like that's what the gallery wants or like that's what the public wants and that's what's selling, you know, for example. And also it makes me think of this other thing that when, an, when that uh, I think I notice sometimes in artists that when they are, they be, they think they have become too familiar with either the subject matter or the technique, they start doing something really that I am personally irritated by, which is like de-skilling, quote unquote, for example, as a yeah. way to find, to just do something different. And I think that what you are trying to do, which is like, think about how to solve the problem is way more difficult than just like, I'm going to splash the paint on the, you know, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Or so, so it's like, yeah. I don't know. What do you think about those things? <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's the challenge. Certainly the marketplace plays a big role in all of this, you know, that, you know, there are people that just want easy art, you know, they just want something that it's almost like a visual white noise, you know, it doesn't bother you, it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't 
it doesn't even wake you up. It just sort of disappears. It's just, you know, it's decor, right? Mm. So that's, that's one problem. It, but the other problem, you know, is signature style too, because I think there's a lot of pressure if you're successful in a particular way with a particular idiom um, to just do that for the rest of your life until, you know, like, it's like you're just writing checks to yourself. You're not really making art any longer. Mm -hmm. You're just sort of making product. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for in indulging in that uh, last muse there. And I, I'll, I, I will start closing it out now, Peter. So um, what are you, why don't you tell our viewers and listeners where your work can be found? Is there anything you want to add? Do you have any upcoming projects, any upcoming classes, anything in particular you want to talk about? Uh, like I said, the show that's up in Dallas is up until March 25th. And um, you know, it's the first time I've shown in Dallas and I, I really like the gallery that I'm working with there. Um, uh, and I continue to work with Linda Warren projects, even though her space closed, she's still, mm. uh, active and, uh, representing my work. So, you know, I, and I, I've got a couple of pieces up in San Miguel de Allende, if you happen to be there, it's a, a, a brand new gallery that Michael Healy has started. Um, and that's you know, just a, he's a, somebody, like I said, who's collected my work for decades now and, uh, he had a, a life crisis that kind of forced him to open a gallery. And I, I think mm. he's, yeah, on a new uh, journey that he's okay. really excited by. Okay, good. It must've been a big crisis there. Yeah. If it's like, if he's like, I must open a gallery in Mexico. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, all right. So thank you very much, Peter, for, for your time and for your thoughts and your words. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. Um, if you'd like to support Peter, my podcast, myself, or all three, all corresponding links will be in the caption. Make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know that you saw this episode. And also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel. And thank you very much, everyone, for watching. And I'll, we will see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Gabriella.